the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom show the wake up call on WCOM LP Chapel Hill and Carver 103.5 on your FM dial or live streaming at WCOMFM.org. You can also watch the show on the People's Channel after a week's delay on Thursday night at 10 p.m., Friday morning at 6 a.m., or Tuesday at noon. The show will also be available on our YouTube channel, Wilf Wake Up Call. I'm Mir Schwinzer here with our host, Lori Hoyt, and Emily O'Hare on the camera. Today our special guests are Emily Sutton and Lib Hutchby. Thanks, Sierras. Uh, we're here in good old WCOM, uh, Carborough's wonderful radio station. And we're delighted we have two guests today. And we're going to start off. Emily Sutton is, if I have this right, the river keeper for the Haw River, which is a, a beautiful river, but it needs a lot of keeping. So welcome, Emily. Thank you. Yeah, so this is World Water Day. And uh, uh, we're celebrating by having Emily here and Lib, who's one of our Wilf sisters and who is on our uh, environment committees. So Emily, what, what's happening with the Haw and are you doing any celebration about Water Day? And Well, there's a lot going on right now. Um, the Haw River Watershed, so the Haw River Assembly, we work throughout the whole watershed. So. The Hall River itself is about 110 miles. Um, it covers about eight counties. It starts out of a little crayfish hole in Forsyth County and then goes a little past Jordan Lake where the deep comes together with the, the Haw to form the Cape Fear. And so we focus a lot on the main stem of the Haw, but we also do work in all of the tributaries. So there's over 900 miles of streams that make up the Haw River watershed. So that's a lot of um, different issues that we see in different counties. So like you said, the Haw River is really beautiful. It's one of my personal favorites, but I'm a little biased. Um, but there's a lot of threats to the watershed. So in different counties, there are different problems. Um, Alamance and Rockingham and Guilford are very industrial counties. So we have a lot of textile a lot of um, these perfluorinated compounds that we're hearing about like Gen X and PFAS, mm -hmm. um, contaminants that uh, harm drinking water quality and that aren't taken out in drinking water processes. But we've also got uh, CAFAs, contained animal feeding operations. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have the swine what, operations. Say that again? Contained animal feeding operations. So those are like your factory farms. So uh, when we think about that, we usually think about swine production, which we have a lot on the eastern part of the state. Mm -hmm. um, the Haw River watershed, we have about three swine facilities, and two of them are owned by universities, so that's not our problem. But we have a lot of poultry operations, more and more every year. Um, so that's mm -hmm. one industry that is threatening the Haw. But there's also a lot of beautiful things too. We have a great park system. We've have got um, Jordan Lake State Park and Lower Hall State Natural Area. There's a lot of um, wilderness still in the Haw River watershed that provides a lot of habitat and uh, a way to dilute all of those pollutants for the water quality. So it's a beautiful river. So, so I didn't realize that. So. Are you the only river keeper? Are you for the haw? For the haw, you're the, you're, the, you're it. I'm the one. We I'm not the only staff person. I, well, don't I was just going to say, I hope you have a staff. We do. So uh, we have a great executive director, Elaine Kioso. She oh, was the haw river keeper for a long time. Um, she's been with the organization since day one. Um, yeah, and then I've, we, I've seen her in some documentaries on on WUNC. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So then we also have a um, event coordinator, Erin Job, and she helps coordinate. We just had a huge cleanup-a-thon. Every year we have a big mm. watershed-wide cleanup. Wow. And so this year it was last Saturday, and we had, I can't speak to how many teams she organized or how many total bags, but just in Saxe Hall alone, where I organized, we had over 70 volunteers and picked wow. up over 80-something bags of trash mm. and tires, too. And so Aaron organizes that, and usually we have over, well over a hundred volunteers, and 
many bags throughout the entire watershed. So, you know, it, it is still absolutely amazing to me what slobs we all are. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's yeah. just we are, our church is just uh, and it's a little church is just taking responsibility for a little piece of of Homestead Road here in Chapel Hill. And the amount of trash that people pick up, Emily, you helped out last mm -hmm. time. How many? Yeah. Um, we had at least four bags, uh, and that's only after a couple hours. But there was a lot of plastic, plastic bottles, um, bags of uh, beer bottles, just the whole bag, chucked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, people just throw, yeah, just, throw them, I know. Away, it's, throw it them was, out. My, my daughter lives in a little um, neighborhood off of uh, um, Bethel Hickory Grove Church Road, and she said she doesn't know whether people come in on her street. She's in a little cul-de-sac to eat their lunch, but after they leave, they throw out Burger King bags, and, you know, mm -hmm. they just just throw it right out there. And mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, these are grown-up people. I mean, I don't... Their mothers, I guess, never taught them. I don't know. I don't understand the, that that level of, of trash throwing. Well, I think a lot of, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, there are people who deliberately litter, but a lot of it, too, is just stormwater. I mean, if you think about every uh, time that um, there's a big flood or your yeah. trash can is outside and gets knocked over and some things go into the storm drain, all uh, of that eventually makes its way to the river. And so, yes, there are definitely people who deliberately litter and mm -hmm. just throw their things out carelessly. But I think the majority of what we see, these little styrofoam bits and plastic bags and uh, plastic bottles, they float, you know? And so they get carried with water every time that it rains. Oh, well, you, you have a kind heart. <laughs> <laughs> a non I'm not saying that it's a, not a non-judgmental non heart. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's not just all deliberate, deliberate, and uh, 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 so so. And all the tributaries. Do you still have that wonderful thing where you bring the school kids from all over? We do the learning celebration. Did yeah. you tell a little bit about that? A I lot would of love to. Don't know about it. Yeah. So every year we have. Um, it starts in late September. It's uh, last week of September and the first two weeks of October for staff people. But every day a different group of fourth graders comes to the river and we have a full day of a field trip for the uh, fourth graders. Well, it's a half day with lunch. Um, so the fourth graders get there at like 8.30 and then they go through different stations. We show them mm. about river clay and how that clay is formed. We show them about um, how stormwater works, and so we have this great Enviroscape model where there's a town and you have Kool-Aid powder and cocoa powder to <laughs> represent all the different sources of pollution, and then they have a big rainstorm with spray bottles. You can see how that impacts mm -hmm. the water quality. Um, and then we also do a macroinvertebrate section. That's my favorite station because all the kids get to look at the different bugs mm. and that are in the water, and different bugs have different um, standards for how much pollution they can live in. And so some bugs are indicators of good water quality. And so we show all the kids these things and they just get so excited. And some of the kids, you know, they've never been to a stream side before. And mm -hmm. we make sure that happens. We have um, a nature hike where the kids just get to walk by the river and explore and just sit quietly if they want to and look at the water. So it's really, it's a really great program. We've been doing it for, oh man, 27 years maybe? Um, I think this will be our 30th year actually. This coming year is our 30th. And that's, Erin uh, Job takes that on and she masters that every year. She's our coordinator for that. Can yeah. you tell us where that is? Sure. I volunteered a school in Durham and oh, the kids would love that. Yeah, so the first week we do it is in Bynum. It's in the lower state uh -huh. uh, natural area. And then the second week we're in Saxbaha, and the third week we're up at a place called Camp Gill Rock. It's right on the Guilford and Rockingham County okay. line. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah. yeah, years ago when I was younger, for a couple of years I volunteered, and uh, it was great fun. And you're right, mm -hmm. a lot of the kids had never been out in nature. And, and you know, I think it's so, that's doubly important that 
doing things like that because I think Thomas Berry, one of our favorite ecologists, has said that if, if you love it, then you want to protect it. You know, and I think that's so important for so many children that are deprived, even kids who are um, a middle class. Uh, people are so fearful these days, or they keep the kids home, or they schedule them with 20 million activities, or the school bus gets home late. They just don't go out rolling around like we did when, when I was very young. And, and uh, so they don't get that love of nature. Pardon? I was just curious. I may I ask a question? You, yes, yeah, you may ask. I mean, you're, it, it's a fascinating uh, that there are certain bugs, you said, that um, are more tolerant of pollution than others. Do you, can you, like, what? Sure. So what kind uh, of bug size are? All, <laughs> yeah, these are all. Um, most of them are in their larval form when they're in the water. So like. A uh, dragonfly, for example. Mm -hmm. Dragonflies are not necessarily pollution tolerant if they can fly away from pollution. So in their larval stage, they're trapped in the water. If the mm. water quality is really poor, mm -hmm. then they can't survive. They can't find their food. They can't, um, they can't breathe. They have, you know, gills and exoskeletons. Mm -hmm. And so um, Dragonflies are actually one of the semi-pollution tolerant ones, but that's just an easy example because everyone knows what a dragonfly looks like. Um, but mayflies and stoneflies, those are very pollution sensitive. And so if we see uh, stoneflies, mayflies, water pennies in the water, and we see a variety of different types of macroinvertebrates, then it's a good sign of water quality. Things like um, leeches, aquatic worms, certain types of snails, those types of things, they can survive in anything. So if we're only finding that, then it's a bad sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, that, that's very interesting. Yeah. I love that. I love the bugs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now how long have you been the, a river keeper? I've been the river keeper for about two years. Um, I've been with Haw River Assembly for almost three years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a new thing. So do other river keepers, do you all get together and trade ideas on how to Yeah, protect? we work together really closely, especially all of the water keepers in North Carolina, because um, we work on a lot of state policy stuff together. Mm -hmm. And so some things that we all deal with are sanitary sewer overflows, um, these contained animal feeding operations, uh, wastewater treatment plant contamination, or uh, sediment pollution from development, all of these things that we work together really closely on. Uh, we're trying to figure out a project to do around microplastics. You all mentioned plastic bottle trash, mm -hmm. and that's something that is in our surface water every day. And so we're trying to work together to get a sampling program around microplastics and advocate for a ban against the ban on single-use plastics, because right now North Carolina has a ban that municipalities are not allowed to ban plastic bags or single-use plastics or straws oh, statewide. Okay. So if we get data to show that this is affecting our water, mm -hmm. then we can move forward on an advocacy tool. So the, the, the state, um, I know we, we're a state that uh, they have a a lot of power of what, of what municipalities can do. But I thought that I just read that Orange County was having a ban the straws month. I guess they can try to do it uh, until the state slaps them on their hand and say they can't. It's voluntary. So mm -hmm. businesses can take a pledge. Durham does this as well. Okay. Um, and probably other counties, but I'm. I only know my watershed, yeah. but um, <laughs> you, they have a pledge that businesses can voluntarily uh, say that they won't use straws anymore, but Orange County can't say, we will no longer have straws in the county, or we will no longer have shopping I centers see. that use plastic bags. But they can't, because yeah, I, I think public education is so important, and uh, and that was what I was going to ask, in your work, do you get to... Uh, get articles in the newspapers or uh, I mean, people use social media now so much, which is kind of, I don't know a whole lot about, but are there ways that you can try to put out alerts of, about what's happening with the river or 
try to educate people about how to protect the river? Absolutely, yeah. Um, we have, I write op-eds and letters to the editor a lot. That's a mm. pretty standard way to get um, more variety from, uh, or a more broader reach, I guess. But we send out action alerts and newsletters oh. to mm -hmm. our members. We have over a thousand members in the watershed. Um, and then we have a Facebook and Instagram and Twitter where we do alerts like that. But we also um, do some uh, like official action network alerts, like this uh, Waters of the U.S. rule is a rule revision that the Trump administration is threatening to cut protections for s specific streams and wetlands that are no longer protected under the Clean Water Act, which would have huge implications for water quality wow. because it's all those tributi tributary feeder streams. Um, so things like that that we really need to push advocacy and we really need to get as many people to submit comments as possible. Mm. Um, those types of things we try to push regularly and so oh, good. Good big for outreach. You. Yeah. yeah. But like you said, you know, you love what you protect and you only know you only love what you know and so it's just getting people to know and learn about these issues. Mm -hmm. And I imagine with that thousand members when you get information out to them that each one of them probably does their best to spread that information to their networks too so that that's that's the hope yeah that's I mean, hope. we're a membership based organization so we um it's it's a fee to become a member but that supports our staff and our admin costs but um, they get a lot with it too, and so they get talking points, they get what we're doing regularly, yeah, all of the yeah. events and actions that are going on in the watershed. Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to give you a little break and turn to Lib, and mm -hmm. you are just back from a major conference mm -hmm. that Al Gore, I think, sponsored? That's correct. It was uh, it is called a, a climate reality um, leadership training. It was in Atlanta uh, last week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, but uh, it was a, it was a splendid experience to meet. Uh, actually, there were people from. 44 different countries and... That's uh, what I thought I heard and then somebody <laughs> said, I'm sure you mean states. And I said, no, I think she said countries. That's, that's what we were told, you know, of, of wow. 1,800 people. So it's very uh, um, smartly done in a large group. If you can imagine having a workshop uh, with that many people in the room. Um, wow. So we were divided at the table, different tables and we had quite a good um, number of North Carolinians going, so that was exciting that so many of us were trained and the same had the same experience uh, with Al Gore and uh, the and it was tough, you know. It's very intense, as you can imagine, to learn to uh, pay attention, more attention to how hot it's getting and how wet it is in one place and drought in another and and the um, it, it, it was just uh, an opportunity to be with people who truly care what's going to happen in the future and what's happening right now. For example, we have p folks, uh, one of the men at, at our table uh, is living down in Edwards, North Carolina, a place near Newburgh. And he explained that his story that he had, uh, had been flooded three times. He repaired his house and it got flooded again. And then the earth around the house is so soft that the um, you know, trucks could not get in to uh, take away the trash and things that need to be taken away after the storm. So. There are these details of life, like a woman in Wilmington who said, um, uh, well, we had, we had a water faucet, excuse me, we said a water faucet. So uh, they had in Wilmington, North Carolina, after the storm, uh, no access to water, uh, as you can imagine, because it was contaminated with coal ash and Gen X and whatever else came mm -hmm. downstream on Cape Fear River. And, um, so uh, they were expected to be able to get water
from a pump so they had access to water and that was probably uh, I don't want to be inaccurate in my telling of the story but I think it was 30 minute drive or something like that from her particular place of residence and she couldn't get there you know obviously mm. to uh, when the roads are blocked and there so there were those those kinds of issues where access to water is um, is a huge issue during any kind of disaster and there needs to be more planning ahead and how we will get get water and um, clean food to people during disasters. Um, so this was a, a major conference to, you said it was a leadership training, so... That's what it was named, and yeah, uh, we, um, well, we are expected to, of course, participate. Yeah, uh, and I guess go back to all of you to your home and countries tell and the story communities. And try to um, figure out solutions that are appropriate to the locality and uh, you would like to know, I think, that there was uh, participation on last Friday, I believe, on that, the uh, kids, where the students walked off and had a, they did their strike from school mm -hmm. in an effort to alert the, the public that this is an issue that we are expecting to do something about. 1.4 million, 1.4 million students around the world and in Atlanta, there were uh, there was a panel of some of these students, including our own Lily Levine, who's from Raleigh, and uh, and the 11-year-old uh, young man who you see on TV, I guess most uh, is named Eli, who is uh, uh, <laughs> he is part of the Children's Trust Fund that is suing so this, the government. <laughs> Uh, because the government is not protecting the children's future. So there were, you know, the, there were so many incredible people, in, including our own Bishop Barber, uh, who... Oh, it's Bishop now. Bishop Barber, Barber was there with uh, Al Gore leading a, a conversation like we're having here today where we, where they just had the uh, opportunity to discuss how they got into all this and well it was the so poor was people's really campaign that kind of sponsored you all with they had the bus anyhow what right the poor, the poor people's campaign offered a, a bus and uh, maybe two um, one went to Augusta Georgia but I met people from other states who yeah. were involved in the poor people's campaign wonderful yeah that and that's what's so important is these different groups all pulling together. What do, what do they talk a lot now about silos that people just get in certain right. things? But we've, you know, I think when it comes to the climate and the environment, that affects everything. You know, no matter what, you can't if you can't breathe, you can't vote. I mean, it's exactly, and this is exactly what Dr. Leo uh, Woodbury said. He was in South Carolina, and he's uh, organized. Uh, Justice First, which has gone into 12 states and 26, I believe, uh, uh, cities so far, in an effort to say we have to work together, we need to form more coalitions, we need to be able to talk about justice first. Mm -hmm. And that's not saying, well, oh, justice is one of our issues and this over here is another one of our issues, but. Mm -hmm. Justice first is his way of saying all of us need to come together mm -hmm. to make it happen, and uh, and we can do it when we work together. It makes more sense when we work together. Well, I think it's wonderful that that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, it's a Dr. Oh, Bishop Barber <laughs> is involved because for a long time the the climate uh, organizations seemed pretty much mostly white. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important that now um, somebody like uh, Bishop Barber is getting, because he is his wonderful about bringing blacks, whites, 
left, right, everyone together. And I think that that is, is wonderful that we're all going to have to work together. It's, it's a, we're all in crisis. And the whole thing with water, um, you know, with, with the haw, I mean, there's right now what they're saying in out west there that it looks like an ocean in Iowa or someplace. I think the governor take, took a look and said, it looks like an ocean out there and the same thing around was at Mozambique, someplace in Africa too, that it's like too much water and then, but is that water that you can drink even there? And then, then potable water, water that's drinkable, uh, it could be another whole issue. So. Well, on the Thursday night, uh, Bishop Barber, Al Gore, Al's, uh, Al Gore's uh, daughter, uh -huh. and um, persons who represented different uh, faiths, and we all met at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is a historic place. Um, in Atlanta. This is in Atlanta. Across the street from the, what we said that was the original yeah. Ebenezer Baptist Church. But it was a very moving and inspiring evening uh, to be able to listen and to have the opportunity to have Native American presence at, mm. uh, and everything that we did and the diversity uh, of opportunity to, to discuss it. And, and so this sort of leads me, if I may, to this uh, whole World Water Day uh, issue, yeah. uh, or Water Day 2019. And we oh, have to okay. Break first. okay, we're going to take a break and sure. then we're going to come back to that. Um, we're taking a station break and then. This is Will's Wake Up Call on WCOMLP Chapel Hill and Carver, 103.5 FM. You can stream us live at WCOMFM.org. So, Iris, do you know of any particular things that are happening that you want to think it's going to tell you about <laughs> about well, yes about the water days or anything else that going on that you I think Emily any you no know, I think I think that's going to be the main thing except mm -hmm. there is a conference uh, this weekend also at the FedEx building on uh, Gaza and the Palestine situation and that's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the FedEx building. So one would have to look that up uh, to see if there's still some availability. But um, the main thing that's going to go on, Lib is now going to tell us about. Go for it, Lib. Well, this is uh, <laughs> important to World Water Day in general. Um, and so because uh, Wilf and Friends of Bowling Creek and the Grudge and Grannies have all gone in together to organize uh, and to put emphasis on World Water Day. Um, we, have, we were in Hillsborough, Tana and I were in Hillsborough this morning on radio uh, in the sister station and we uh, got, had a chance to talk about water and then uh, advertise. Uh, oh. Our World Water Day experience for the 23rd of March, which is Saturday. Then this afternoon, obviously, your hospitality is most gracious to, to let us uh, explain again that our, uh, our uh, experience with the Hall River Assembly is amazing. And, um, you know, John Wagner is on the board, I think, of Hall yes. River Assembly mm -hmm. and participates in teaching the children as she, as uh, Emily has described. So we're all, part, you know, a part of this. And tomorrow at two, uh, there will be another um, program here at WCOM and um, um, about water. And Jovita Lee will be here to be interviewed, uh, who is the, I mean, Jovita is the um, uh, camp, is an organizer with uh, North Carolina a biodiversity center. So, Good old WCOM. This is such a community treasure, you know. It really, it's, it's wonderful. It's great, and I want to just for people who don't know, John Wagner and Lib are part of, and Wilf is the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So we throw that around a lot, and some a lot of people may have no idea what what the Wilf is, and the Wilf is a shortcut for a very 
wordy title. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, yeah, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, affectionately known as Will, and John Wagner and Lib, and um, you're the main ones. I think Margaret is now working with you, Margaret Herring. But uh, yeah, so that along with the Bowling Creek people. Right, and so uh, Friends we also Creek. with the Raging Grannies, and there's the a group Raging in Grannies. Durham, Libby Johnson is leading that group, um, and they will be um, focusing on water at, at an after school program at E.K. Poe Elementary, and there are about mm -hmm. 85 students on Friday afternoon. So Great. that's actually March 22nd is the, the, the day. official uh, water World Water Day. World Water and Day. Our event on Saturday morning will be at uh, the Umstead Park in Chapel Hill, not to be confused with the State Park, uh, but it is in Chapel Hill at Umstead Drive, and we will be delighted for all of you to come and and enjoy with us uh, the experience with uh, Mary Sonis is coming to talk about wildlife and bring some of her photographer uh, oh, photography. She's wonderful, yeah. um, uh, J Jason Crazy Bear will be there to have to offer honoring the earth, the earth and through a water ceremony. And oh, that, I saw that. That's drop. wonderful. Um, I don't want to leave anybody out. I'm, uh, Julie and McClintock will be there to discuss some of the history of, of Bowling Creek and you know coal ash. Actually there is a uh, the police station you know was built atop coal ash no. So there's mm. very much concern at Bowling Creek right here in Chapel Hill. Which was only come, came out in the news not that long ago like maybe 10 years ago yeah. ago. You, that, that, that they're sitting on top of a coal ash dump. So we, we have these issues right here. Um, you want to say anything about that piece? About the coal ash? About coal ash and Bowling Creek or? Sure. Um, so we have, we had a, a big cleanup on Bowling Creek this past week and I think the teams got over 40 bags out of Bowling Creek, mm. uh, which is pretty incredible. So um, then the, with the coal ash stuff, there has been some uh, discussion about how it will just be capped in place and ignored. So we don't let that. Um, but we have a couple of World Water Day events that we're doing for this week and next week. Um, this kind of overlaps with a couple different creek weeks throughout the watershed. Mm -hmm. So Durham County has their creek week this week. Um, tomorrow we have a big volunteer celebration where there's all these different volunteer programs that Hall River Assembly does, but there's other folks that will be there at the Fillery um, Shop House in Durham between 4 and 6. And so we'll be training volunteers how to get involved with um, eco protection. And so we'll be doing a river watch training where we train volunteers to go out and monitor their station four times a year. Um, we also have a volunteer program about sediment uh, pollution, and so we'll show volunteers how mm -hmm. to identify a potential sediment violation, document it, write a report, and then that report goes straight to me and to the sediment and erosion person in the county. Um, and, yeah, and then on Friday we have a big hike on Third Fork Creek in Durham, and then we have like a big celebration afterwards at Beer Study on University Drive. And on at where? At, on, at Beer Study at University Drive. And so the walk will start at 6 and then we'll meet up at Beer Study at 7. Um, and then Saturday we have a River Watch training event at uh, Third Fort Creek at the Hollow Rock State Park in Durham. It's next to Duke Forest there. And so we'll train volunteers how to find all those macroinvertebrates we talked about earlier, get the pH, assess the water quality in a stream that volunteers would get to choose which stream they go to and monitor it four times a year. So if people are listening and there's so, so much that's going to be going on, if they wanted to find out more about the, all these things you're talking about, how do they get in touch with you to 
to find out because it looks like there's a pretty heavy schedule for mm -hmm. the lot. next few days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do they? Well, Keep Durham Beautiful has the Creek Week event website, and so you can just type in Keep Durham Beautiful okay. slash Creek Week, uh -huh. and it'll come up with the calendar of events. But we also have things on our Facebook, so you can find us at Haw River Assembly on Facebook um, or our website at hawriver.org. Okay. I'd like to add that in Durham, mm -hmm. uh, not this Saturday, but the next Saturday, um, there's a, a focus on, on uh, called Lug a Jug. Called what? Lug a jug. Lug a jug. Now, Lug -a -jug. you can almost guess what this is about. Uh -huh. uh, it seems that women across the world average about a six mile hike, shall we call it. But anyway, it's a walk that takes that far, uh, if I'm correct, and, uh, and at getting their water. So, you know, most of us have this uh, incredible opportunity at home to just turn on a faucet. And most people in the world don't have that. So, um, for example, in Ethiopia, I think uh, they have uh, access to maybe a half of a bucket of water a day compared to our 500 buckets of water a day. Mm. So it's a huge discrepancy in the amount of water and the accessibility of water, which is part of the focus of the United Nations uh, right to water. So. Um, so back to Durham, they're having the lug a jug where folks would say, okay, uh, we're going to have a little six mile race, so to speak, and I'll have a jug of water, I'm going to carry this jug of water, and then I'll pass it off, uh, and, uh, and then that person carries it another distance, and uh, it's just a way to focus on how incredible it is uh, to have no access to water in one place, almost mm -hmm. no, none. Or the fact that children can't even go to school in some cases because they're busy going after water and spending so much time mm -hmm. taking care of their food security and the water in the world. And how heavy mm -hmm. water is. That So I take it that part of this luggage jug is, is to help you understand what is it, one gallon of water weighs about eight pounds? Or I, I just know as, as getting older, I, I get some gallon <laughs> jugs at Weaver Street of, of the water there. And, and that water weighs a lot. It really weighs a lot. It really does. So I hope folks will come out on Saturday to uh, this Saturday to uh, uh, Bowling Creek and walk with us. We'll have stations, uh, four stations along the way to learn, and children's activities and things for adults as well. And um, do we have time for me to read one more thing here? Well, sure. we, 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 we've, got, we've got time. Oh, okay. We've got plenty of time for both well, of you. Uh, get, get, just pop, if, if you need something you want to say just like I do, just jump in, okay? Okay. <laughs> well, okay, so um, I I just took a little time because I was curious about how the United Nations might define safe water. So I'm just going to read it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, safely, safe water is defined by the United Nations as safely managed drinking water service. Water that is accessible on the premises, available when needed, and free from contamination. That is huge. That is huge. It's a lot to ask for. Pardon me? It shouldn't be it shouldn't be that hard, but I can't tell you very many people that have water that is freely available and mm -hmm. free of contamination. Exactly. I mean yeah. because we know folks uh, right here around in Salisbury who went for three years and had to because of the coal ash contamination in their private drinking well. Uh, mm. They had to depend on bottled water for everything, washing clothes, well, mm -hmm. you know, er everything. And the problem with that, too, is that there's so many people that might have wells that are contaminated by coal ash, and unfortunately, wells aren't monitored. 
And so if, if I'm a private landowner and I have my own private well, I bear the cost of getting that well tested. And so mm. if I'm getting it tested for heavy metals that might be in coal ash or contaminants that might um, be coming into the groundwater from CAFOs or industrial pollution, any of those things, that those tests are expensive. And I, I can't afford that. No. So we only know the contaminants that are in public drinking waters, and that doesn't really reflect the amount of users that are dependent on wells in the state. Mm. And you mentioned, I mean, I know there's been, uh, was a lot in the paper about Gen X around the Cape Fear Basin mm -hmm. and uh, um, Wilmington being affected, and there's been a lot of coming out about how they've been doing that for t 10 years or more. And unfortunately, in this country, if you introduce a chemical, it's only after it causes problems that it's regulated that you don't have to go beforehand and see is this going to be okay. We don't have the prevention, precautionary measure. But you mentioned Gen X now in the Haw River? So Gen X specifically is not, but Gen X is only, it's one of tens of thousands of these perfluorinated yeah. contaminants. And so PFOA, PFOA, and PFOS, PFOS, um, they are two specific contaminants that came from Teflon, from the DuPont mm. uh, factories. And so mm -hmm. those two contaminants are, have been voluntarily phased out in the United States, but that just means that com companies can add another oxygen mo molecule or one more compound to make it a different uh, molecule chain. And so scientists call it like a game of whack-a-mole, where you regulate PFOA and PFOS, and then another one pops up in its place. Um, and there's, like you said, the precautionary principle, we don't have that here. And so you can add all these different compounds and have no data of how it will affect human health. And you can release it into our drinking water, into the surface water, which then goes to our drinking water because it can't be processed at drinking water plants. This stuff never breaks down. Mm. It's meant to never break down in water. It's for waterproofing. It's for um, mm. fire-resistant materials. Mm. It's in upholstery. It's in everything. So that we have to continue, you know, when they had the Clean Water Act, that really helped a lot. And from what I understand, some of our lakes and rivers really helped them clean up. But it's been steady chipping away at that act. And I think with Trump, he's really stopped some of those regulations. Am I right? Right. So two parts to that question. Because the Clean Water Act, you are required to disclose everything that is being discharged. We have the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. It's the NPDES program that all wastewater treatment plants or um, dischargers have to disclose every contaminant that they're discharging. So how then do we have these unregulated contaminants? Well, it's because they're only certain chemicals that are required to be disclosed and that's the loophole mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. there's not if really in the eyes of the Clean Water Act there should be nothing that's unregulated because it should all be disclosed yeah, yeah. Um, but there's not a limit there's not a standard there's not a guideline for what the numeric value of what can be discharged is mm -hmm. so I get yeah, the, the, what do they always say you should look at the fine print so you hear about something you think oh now I don't have to work and ch check that off in terms of my worry list, but you can't. Right. It takes what constant vigilance and mm -hmm. people like you monitoring things and letting us know, or people like you, uh, you know, that are paying attention to the fine print. Well, you know, we don't have to be scientists to understand that if people are diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm and they have lived close to the coal ash, and one neighbor has the exact same kind of cancer as the next door neighbor or across the street. There must be a correlation. Must be some correlation. So this is, uh, this is part of the public health issue that is mm -hmm. in great need of being addressed 
um, to have some bond, some uh, health studies to look at the possibilities of lung cancer clusters and, um, and know where, where and why that's happening. So I, I don't know enough about where those studies are being uh, done, but I understand there is some attempt now to begin that process. Yeah, well, so, I think the legislature got alarmed enough that they're investigating. I don't know if this study's being done. Do you know if how how deep the investigation is, or? Well, or, or shallow it is. Or so, <laughs> some of it we can talk about. Good question. <laughs> All right. Um, so Cooper just allocated a lot of money to uh, look into emerging contaminants in his proposed budget. Um, so that would allow for increased staff to monitor this. It would allow for a mobile lab to do conduct water sampling. Um, problem with that is that we already have a lot of data that shows that it's there. So we don't need more of that. We need to show where exactly where it's coming from and we need to stop it. So we know the pathways. We've I've been sampling above and below some specific wastewater treatment plants and below sludge fields. So wastewater treatment plants themselves aren't producing this stuff. But the problem is that a lot of these facility, a lot of these wastewater treatment plants have something called pretreatment programs. So without going too much in the weeds, basically all of the different industries in that sewer shed sends their waste to that wastewater treatment plant. It's mixed with municipal dischargers and then it all comes out. So all the solids are not just residual solids. They're not just the things that we use at home. It's all of the, the compounds that come from these industrial facilities too. Mm. So that's going onto fields. It's being rained, it's being carried with rain into the creeks below. And then we can sample above and below wastewater treatment plants, but there may be 40 to 50 significant industrial users coming into that plant. So the how then do we pinpoint which one is producing it? So it's this whole level um, that we are just really starting to unravel. Wow. And when I say we, I don't mean me as a Harbor Assembly is the only one doing this. There are a lot of really great tireless advocates that we're working with um, and meeting with DEQ really regularly to show them our data, ask them what we would like them to do. And when you say there's a lot of really good people working on this, uh, is I take it you mean that there are some staff people, it's not just all volunteers who care deeply, but that there's some institutional, like some, some, some organization, like government organization that's doing this? Well, um, we're meeting with government organizations, we're meeting with folks at DEQ and DWR, um, but the groups that are really doing a lot of work on this with us, with Har River Assembly, is Conservation Network. Um, they're incredible. I love Conservation Network. And so <laughs> these are these are yeah. in North Carolina. Profit, mm -hmm. North Carolina volunteer people. Network. No, they're all staff people. They are staff on these things. Okay. Right. So they're nonprofit. Nonprofit staff. Non governmental, right. but they are um, professionally like staff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a great group of. Uh, experts at Southern Environmental Law Center who have been really helpful with their expertise of the legal system and mm. piecing together any advice that we can get. Mm. Um, so it's it's a big group of folks that are concerned about this. Some folks at Sierra Club have been helpful mm -hmm. um, and the Upper Noose River Keeper Matt Starr has done some work in the, his basin sampling too and but we work with different universities to process our samples. There's no way we could afford the lab costs, but there's some academics that are really concerned about this at mm -hmm. um, NC State, at Duke University, and so they've been processing our samples and analyzing our data. And you, is UNC involved? Um, they haven't been yet, but just because they don't have the equipment to process our samples. Okay, okay. 
Well, that's, that is very, very interesting and, and critical. This is the non-glamorous part of keeping us safe, you know, keeping an eye on those chemicals. We have about five minutes or four minutes, so I just want to let us know our time frame. So be thinking of anything you have not mentioned that would be helpful for our listeners to know about. Uh, uh, and and we'll, we'll, right now we can do that again about if people want more information about the mm -hmm. Haw River, they go to hawriver.org and, and there's a website and then they can get different things like what's what's happening right now, all these all these things coming up with you and Durham. And mm -hmm. they can also go to Durham, um, what was it again? Keep but, Durham Beautiful. Keep Durham Beautiful. And it has a Creek Week tab. And then also about Lug a Jug. Would that be under Keep Durham Beautiful? It might be. I don't know. It might be sure. under that. No, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and, and then in terms of uh, Wilf and the uh, our big celebration for, for celebrating water on Saturday, how who who would they go to? Would they should they go to you directly? Liz? They can go to the Facebook page to our Wilf um, Facebook page, and uh, actually it's Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Triangle Branch. So. Uh, if you go to the Facebook page, it would just be W I L P F. Okay. Okay. Triangle. Tri triangle W I L P F should. So I don't think you have to spell out triangle. Um, you just put the T. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I try, think that's try, the way that 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 is. Try that, and yeah. uh, And I'm sorry, I don't. Yeah. So, so, and again, it would be 10, would to, like 10 to 12 this Saturday, the 23rd. Correct. At Umstead Park on Umstead Road. That's easy to remember, in Chapel Hill. Right, in Chapel Hill. It goes off right, Estes. It's, it's Excuse off, me? Off Estes. It, it, uh, it's off of Martin Luther King. Martin, uh, either, uh, yeah, if you go from oh, Estes. Oh, you go from yeah, Estes, Yeah, if you want to too. come in yeah. from but, uh, across It's closer from the going station. from Martin right. Luther <laughs> King. Yes, yeah, right yeah, down the road that's there. that's true. And uh, uh, so and this. So I'm excited also because Liz Evans is one of our wealth members who is such a skillful origami. Uh, she just she can create most anything with origami, and she has agreed mm -hmm. to uh, be there to teach us how to make frogs. Oh. How to make oh. what? Frogs. So oh. anyway, there are lots of people involved. Uh, our dean is going to play the flute. Uh, so there are so, so many music, individuals that, that be, will participate yeah. and teach us as we go along uh, Ball and Creek. I didn't know that, that Liz Evans was an origami specialist either. She is. But she's she's, she's a, a woman of many things. talents. I'd like just to say a, one or two things and, uh, and I know it's time for us to close. We got a one minute. We go. We got a couple minutes. Well, this is one, and in, in terms of what we think of some solutions, some things. People, a lot, a lot of people want to know what to do. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so when you're working as we do with Haw River, with the specific science around the water itself, that's a that's a hands-on, and it's so important to learn it and to do it. Uh, one of the other campaigns that has come along in the last two weeks is a coalition of, of organizations, including Friends of the Earth and NC Born, that have come together to, uh, and 350.org, I don't even know all the names of the 15, okay, that formed the coalition, and come out with a campaign to speak about the monopoly that Duke Energy has mm -hmm. over the utilities. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the lights we have today and the electricity, and remember that at Duke Energy, at Sharon Harris, mm -hmm. just at that one nuclear power plant alone, over 2,000 gallons of water a minute is extracted mm -hmm. to help cool it oh. so we can keep the lights on. And so as we think about the big picture for our aquifers, and we understand that our bodies are 70% water, the mm -hmm. earth itself is about 70% water, but the available drinking water is minuscule compared to 
what we uh, had hoped, you know, to, when we think about the big picture. So uh, as we think about that big picture and the planet, and understand that uh, you, the utility in North Carolina uses over 70, uses over 70 percent, if not almost 90 percent, as I understand it, uh, just uh, for the for keeping lights on and such. It's a it's a it's a huge issue, mm -hmm. and Duke's monopoly, of course, keeps a, has has thwarted the the opportunities for some people to have rooftop solar. So you mm -hmm. you may have already heard this several times, but well, NC Ward's really been working on that. So so live with this new coalition. Is there some way that we could get more information? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I should uh, I should have. Uh, uh, said okay. that in the beginning, but uh, just we will be on the, uh, t to listen out for ways in which you can uh, go to ncwarn.org. So go to ncwarn.org. Ncwarn.org will have information on how to get more involved in the campaign to stop uh, Duke Energy, or should we say it's called in Duke's Monopoly. Yeah, then, okay. Well, that's, the, we've got a lot of information. We've been having uh, Liv Hutchby from Will Fawn about uh, uh, her trip to Atlanta with the Al Gore campaign. And we've had Emily Sutton, who's a river keeper for the Mighty Haw River, and uh, that's right next door to us here. And uh, I have one of my daughters lives in Chatham. I hope you're listening, Cookie. And I uh, uh, hope she can get involved with, with uh, things that you're doing. And uh, so, Emily, come back at some point, sometime from now, and let us know how all this is going.